So thank you so much for this kind introduction and you know all the heroic work that you and your team has been doing uh, have been doing over the this week. It's a wonderful meeting. Uh, it's it, it's such a regret that we can't be in uh, in South Africa at this moment. We were just joking that uh, you know uh, in physics terms we're all in the momentum eigen stage. You know we are in some sense everywhere and nowhere. So it's great to be together, but of course we'd love to be there in person. And 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 I've been enjoying this virtual conference very very much. So thanks also to all the speakers for the wonderful uh, lectures. Um, so I'm gonna uh, talk uh, quite freely about the interaction between physics and mathematics, uh, but in particular the relation with uh, string theory. And I chose as a title um, a, a small variation on one of the most famous titles in, in mathematical physics, the title of an essay Eugene Wigner wrote in 1960, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. If many of you might know the title, I would really recommend also to read the article. It actually starts in a very interesting way. Uh, the first paragraph, Wigner says, well, there's a, a statistician that meets a classmate and uh, they talk about population uh, dynamics. And, um, and then the uh, classmate actually shows, uh, the statistician uh, shows a graph and the graph and the formula, the formula of the Gaussian distribution. And uh, clearly that formula has a, 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 a pi in it. And so the classmate asks, what's that symbol? He says, well, that's the Greek letter pi. What does it mean? Well, it's the ratio between the circumference and diameter of a circle. And then the friend asked of the statistician, what do circles have to do with populations? And it's a good explanation, a good example of this wonderful property of mathematics to cover so much more than it was perhaps originally uh, invented for or uh, applied to. And by the way, the final paragraph of that essay, I find also quite beautiful. This is it. Uh, Wigner actually ends on this uh, as he call it himself cheerful note that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And then he writes in 1960 that we hope that it will remain valid in the future and that it will extend for better or for worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement to wide branches of learning. And I think that's in some sense a wonderful summary what has happened in the 60 years after this article. Now, there are, uh, this, this view of the appropriateness of math and physics is, uh, is, has been there through the ages. This is a famous quote by Galileo. He wrote about the book of nature that you could read and you can only read it if you know the language. And it's in, as he says, it's written in the language of mathematics, uh, which at that time was Euclidean geometry, so triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. And without, it's impossible to understand a single word, and you're wandering around in a dark labyrinth. Um, this is Arnold Sommerfeld, a famous uh, mentor and ad advisor of so many uh, theoretical physicists at the turn of the 20th century. If you want to be a physicist, you must do three things. First, study mathematics. Second, study more mathematics. And third, do the same. Um, here's uh, Richard Feynman. To those who do not know mathematics, it's difficult to get across a real feeling as to the beauty, the deepest beauty of nature. If you want to learn about nature, to appreciate nature, it's necessary to understand the language that he speaks in. Now, uh, Feynman's, by the way, also uh, known for this uh, famous quote, if all mathematics disappear today, physics would be set back exactly one week. Uh, you know, uh, physicists are arrogant enough that they can invent that mathematics themselves and always felt this was the wonderful put down until actually Michael Atiyah uh, told me the following uh, repost that was the week that God created the world. Um, so there's a long history here and you know certainly I think there's for mathematics often you know mathematics considers itself a platonic science it's involved with physics but it's involved with much more and there's a famous quote by Jean-Pierre Serre, who actually didn't dare to make the remark himself, but he, uh, he told Raoul Bott when they both got the Gulf Prize and Raoul Bott wrote the quote down, while the other scientists search for the rules that God has chosen for this universe, we mathematicians search for the rules that even God has to obey. 
And there's a kind of arrogance sometimes in mathematics. Now, when Hilbert in 1900 uh, puts forward the 23 most important problems in mathematics, uh, which was a very good list, it included the Riemann hypothesis, the Poincare conjecture. He also included problem six, mathematical treatment of the axioms of physics. So what are the axioms? And you know, basically uh, finding a fundamental theory of physics, um, which in his days, uh, he basically thought of probabilities and mechanics. This was before the birth of quantum mechanics, uh, was seen as one of the many open problems in math. Now, there's a kind of a complementary view and uh, I won't tell too many jokes, but this is one of my favorite because it was told to me by a famous mathematician, Alan Kohn, a Fields medalist. He tells the story of the physicist who actually has a, a big bag of dirty laundry. And the physicist walks into the village and he sees a little shop. And the shop says, has a sign, laundrette. But not only that, it also has a sign, cafe, restaurant, hotel. So basically it's a shop of everything and of course the shop is run by a mathematician and the physicist comes with the dirty clothes and say can i wash my clothes here and then the mathematician say no 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 you're confused um the only thing that we sell here are advertising signs and um so sometimes i think from a physics perspective uh mathematics is a lot of useful or useless i must say terminology uh that actually doesn't help to solve physical problems now, I just want to make the case today is that mathematics might be more an environmental science than mathematicians think. Uh, you know, famously, uh, geometry was born by studying astronomy and studying the way land was distributed. So even in the ancient thousands of years ago, uh, basically the language of geometry was born through the study of uh, the night sky. Uh, another famous example is, of course, Newton, Leibniz and others inventing the language of calculus, of analysis in order to approach mechanical problems. Uh, that language wasn't there already in mathematics. It gave a new vocabulary that was, of course, extremely successful. Uh, another interesting example is the birth of modern algebra and symmetry. Uh, the fact that you know, symmetry actually was discovered mathematically in the context of solving polynomial equations. It's uh, Abel and then Galois studying the quintic equation uh, somehow led them to study the structure of groups, in particular, you know, the symmetric group on five elements. And so I think the big question that we are confronted right now, if we take the modern language of physics, quantum field theory, particle string theory, what is the natural mathematical language that will come out of it? And I think this is somehow a great promise. I would say we only have little parts of this new language, but I think it's extremely exciting because clearly quantum field theory, quantum mechanics is a deeper level of reality. And if classical mechanics has been such a fruitful source for new mathematics, uh, in some sense, uh, quantum mechanics, which is in many ways the true language of physics should be even much more richer. Now, uh, this is, by the way, an interesting element to think about the context of mathematics. And for me, the good example is this uh, wonderful article that was written by the famous uh, mathematician Bill Thurston, great geometer, you know, the uh, pioneer of three-dimensional uh, geometry, uh, who, who lost um, much too early, uh, who wrote a, a paper on proof and progress in mathematics. And in that paper, he asked the question, is there a best definition of a mathematical object? And he takes as an example, the derivative, the derivative of a function, something that we all use every time. And he starts, well, what is the right definition of a derivative? And he starts, well, we start with the formal definition. It's the epsilon delta definition that you learn in a rigid course of calculus. Uh, quite remarkably in the printed version of the article, he makes a mistake in this. But you know, this is only gives a limited intuition. Uh, we can think of it also as the rate. There's a natural sense of velocity. And if you think of a derivative as a velocity, then you also know it has an orientation because it could be a three-dimensional vector, in fact, an n-dimensional vector. Or you can think of it as a tangent. 
But then actually it's very natural generalizes to a slope, to a function of more than one variable. Or think of it as they did in the birth of calculus as an infinitesimal change. Or think about it as a discrete change uh, where you have a, a delta instead of a, a derivative. Or think of it symbolic. Now you can take the derivative of x to the n where x is not a, a number, but it could be very much more complicated algebraic object. And the multiplication can be more complicated, but you can still have derivatives. Or think of it as the linear approximation. Or think of it as microscopic, zooming in into a function. If you zoom in, every function becomes linear. And then at some point, Thurston says, well, the definition 37 for him, that the derivative of a real function f in a domain day, while well, you can read it, is a Lagrangian section of a cotangent bundle. And Thurston describes, there was a moment where definition 37 was the appropriate one for me. And I guess his point is that all these definitions, all these different contexts, all these different perspectives add value to the concept of a derivative. And so for instance, just to give an example, in knot theory, there's the concept of a derivative because you can look at the intersection of two strands in a knot, in a projection of a knot, and make it an either an overcrossing and an undercrossing, and take the difference of these two different kinds of topologies. So the use of the concept of a derivative is so high because it's moving in this very large space of possible interpretations. Now, another element to think about this math physics context is uh, what I would say truth and beauty. That's actually the motto of the Institute for Advanced Study. And um, in fact, the epigraph of weakness essay starts by a quote from Bertrand Russell, where he describes the beauty of mathematics, this supreme beauty, cold and austere, um, the true spirit of the light, uh, clearly written uh, a long time ago. But you know, it's, it's, it's one of the driving forces of mathematics. And again, there are many quotes about this power of truth and beauty. Um, Famously, uh, Hermann Weil, professor at the Institute for a long time, was asked, you know, well, what do you, is there, do you have a preference? And he said, well, he always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. But if I, if I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful. Uh, this Paul Dirac, who famously said, it's more important for our equations to be beautiful than have them fit experiments, which is, a, I think, a wonderful quote. You know, there's, there's a lot of depth to that. Uh, this, by the way, an opposite point of view that I want to contrast with this, which is, I think, nicely formulated by John Wheeler. Uh, John Wheeler said, you know, every law of physics pushed to the extreme will be found to be statistical and approximate, not mathematically perfect and precise. And if you think about that, that's, again, beauty of a very different kind, because the statistical nature, so to say, allows the, the, the mathematics to breathe and be flexible and allow modifications, you know, the rigidness has a certain um, fragility. It can easily break and snap. While if there is a certain statistical flavor to it, we'll see this in a moment, it adds a lot of flexibility. And, and there's this famous quote I like very much by Francis Crick, co-discoverer of DNA. Any theory that accounts for all the facts is wrong because some of the facts are always wrong. So we have to be very uh, hesitant to uh, embrace absolute truth. Now, uh, beauty in, in mathematics, I would say, also comes in various shapes and sizes. And you know, one distinction I want to make that you know, there are essentially two kinds of uh, flavors of aesthetics. There is, a, I would say, a universal beauty. Uh, that's the people who are excited about that, they like like the concept abstract concepts like a vector space and arbitrary dimension or linear algebra or calculus or category theory. Well, there is another brand of aesthetics which likes the exceptions to the rule, like the platonic solids or the Lie group E8 because it's the most complicated one. Or the monster group, which is in some sense the, the most complicated simple group or the octonians. And there is a certain draw to this too. And in fact, you, you might see both of these kinds of appreciation of mathematical beauty in physics. The, the second one, uh, I like to compare to these kind of uh, 
17th century uh, cabinets of curiosity, the Wunderkammers, that are they're strange exotica that we are feel attracted towards. And so the question is, even if truth, if beauty is a guidance, which of the two variants is the most productive one? And there's a famous cautionary tale, let me share it here, which is uh, uh, Johannes Kepler. Now, Kepler was absolutely fascinated by um, geometry and by the platonic solids. And in, uh, in his youth, he was still uh, very young, he had a cosmology based on this. It's a famous story. He thought, well, at that point, he wanted to explain why there are six planets. There are six known planets at that time uh, that in the Copernican uh, model would uh, rotate around the sun. And he knew there were five platonic solids. And so he uh, was able to connect the two facts by building a cosmology, um, that is to say a set of interlocking uh, platonic solids can be done in a, a certain number of ways. And you can find a model by fitting these solids uh, inside each other that would give a prediction for the ratio of uh, the sizes, the radii of the orbits of the planets. Um, and that was actually his one of his earliest publication. Now, now we think that it's like wrong, it's wrong in so many different ways. But what I like about the story is that Kepler himself proved it wrong. And he proved it wrong when his, based on careful observation, he noticed that the planets are not moving on circles, but on ellipses, which of course totally destroys this model. Um, he called them ovals. And there's an interesting um, correspondence of Kepler with uh, actually the assistance of, the, uh, uh, of uh, Tycho Brahe, he, of course, uh, was to a large extent uh, a mentor of Kepler and produced uh, a lot of the astronomical data. And uh, he was accused of kind of making physics ugly by introducing these ovals. And he writes back, he says, well, it's as though I have sinned with the oval I've left. It's like being punished for leaving behind one barrow full of shit, although I have cleaned the rest of the Augean stables. So famous metaphor of the Augean stable. So he cleaned all the messy mathematics, but he left something behind, which was the ugly shape of a ellipse. And we would say it's ugly because it's not rigid. It has a moduli, it can be all possible shapes. Of course, now we know that all these celestial orbits are, are, are conics. And of course, beautifully explained by Newton's one over R squared law. And they're all sections of conics, so parabola, circles, ellipses. Actually, there's a unified theory, and there's a there's a beautiful symmetry uh, underlying it. In fact, the symmetry SO4. So I think there's a perfect example where uh, Kepler was attracted by the exotic brand of aesthetics, but actually found that the generic one was much more powerful. Now, if we move to modern history, so say the last 60 years after uh, weakness essay. In some sense, things moved in the in the wrong directions. In the 1960s, you can argue that actually um, there was a lot of separation between mathematics and physics. In the 1950s and 60s, I think mathematics felt it was needed to have you know, move inward, look at the internal rigor, and rebuild mathematics. In, an, in a very precise and rigorous fashion. It's usually associated with the French Bourbaki style of doing mathematics. Um, the famous quote of the, the Bourbakist was structures are the weapons of mathematicians. So it in, introduced uh, what sometimes physicists think of uh, abstract nonsense in great quantities. And on the side of physics, in fact, there was an opposite movement. You know, in, in many ways, people declare the end of reductionism. So in the 1960s, when there was this barrage of elementary particles or uh, nuclear particles, uh, hadrons, we would say now, uh, endless numbers of particles, um, there was a certain current, the S matrix theory, that basically uh, was revolutionary in the sense that it uh, rejected reductionism and basically proposed that there are no fundamental particles. There are no fundamental laws. In the language of Geoffrey Chu, the aristocratic structure of atomic physics as governed by quantum electrodynamics, that was the gold standard of um, 
of theoretical physics, very simple laws, very precise calculations, was replaced by the revolutionary character of nuclear particle democracy, as Chu said, every nuclear particle should receive equal treatment under the law. And that meant in some sense that this dream of a mathematical precise underpinning evaporated. Uh, no, uh, there's a famous uh, episode, we'll see them soon, uh, Wheeler and uh, John Wheeler and Richard Feynman. So John Wheeler was organizing an, a meeting uh, a, a, of mathemat mathematicians and physicists in 1966, and he invited Feynman to come and talk to the mathematicians uh, about what physics were doing, and this was part of his of his of his letter of invitation, uh, you know, uh, trying to get to express ourselves in the language meaningful to mathematicians, you know, um, others. So he was really trying to do the good thing, and Feynman answered, uh, I think, in a one sentence response. I'm not interested in what today's mathematicians find interesting. Uh, end of discussion. And, uh, you know, of course, this year we sadly lost uh, Freeman Dyson. Um, and, you know, I think one of the greatest mathematical physicists um, of, of the last, uh, you know, 100 years. And Freeman famously wrote in 1972, that he was acutely aware of the fact that the marriage between mathematics and physics, which was so enormously fruitful in past centuries, has recently ended in divorce. Well, I would say the opposite was true. Um, you know, this kind of black box image of the S matrix theory and, and the, the, the giving up on reductionism was you know, as strong as it could be, because not only could the box be opened, but you know, inside was the standard model of elementary particle physics, uh, this is, uh, in a very concise, concise way, the Lagrangian describing all particles and fields in the standard model. And the great thing is that all the elements that appear there, gauge fields, connections, uh, covariant derivatives, uh, spinners, uh, all are natural objects in the language of differential geometry, differential topology, actually objects that mathematicians could recognize if somebody explained to them what the mathematical interpretation of these physical objects were. And of course, part of this is that you know, the, in a reductionist image, you know, these particle processes are described by looking at all these individual Feynman diagrams, the individual processes where particles exchange force particles and can do this in a very, very complicated way. And each of these Feynman diagrams could be calculated with you know, unbelievable precision. Uh, as you know, some of the most precise measurements in physics in total, up to 12 decimals, are actually done in uh, this very esoteric branch of the very smallest particles. Now, I would say this dialogue that was so successful in the past, this marriage started in a subtle way. An important element was actually a seminar run in Stony Brook, uh, New York, Long Island, in the early 70s between uh, Xi and Yang, who were then Point headed the physics department and Jim Simons, who headed the math department, and they started to compare notes. And you know, they, in this this article that actually gave a review of it, it's it's essentially a dictionary. You know, they find out that what what the physicists were studying, in terms of gauge potentials and you know Dirac monopoles, had interpretations in mathematics as principal fiber bundles, as connections and curvatures, as the the first Chern class. Uh, in some sense, there was a very nice dictionary. Uh, note, by the way, that in this dictionary, the sources of the gauge field uh, on the left-hand side, for, particularly for the non-abelian gauge field, uh, were absent yet in, in mathematics. And you know, now we have a much better interpretation, but they are they, 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 they observables, etc. So, but it's it, it's it's a good example of uh, a dictionary um, as a metaphor for the interaction between physics and mathematics. So I would say from that point on, we got a, a blossoming uh, connection. And you know, I summarized this uh, 20 years ago in a cartoon uh, that you know, in 1968, we had the physicists studying Feynman diagrams, the mathematicians doing uh, you know, deep things in topology and index theory. And, and the two were not able to, to discuss. And, and, and uh, 30 years later, uh, 
you know, uh, sadder and wiser, certainly the mathematicians start to study Feynman diagrams and the physicists start to understand index theory because it's relevant for um, anomalies, etc. So um, I think this is what we call progress in science. And Jeff, when he invited me to give this public lecture, asked me very poignantly, what's the third cartoon? You know, where are we now? How would you sketch it? Uh, and I'll, I will come back to that. Now, we, I talked about beauty and mathematics, but I think it's important also to realize that there are two strands of beauty in, uh, in physics. And um, what David Gross liked to say, the, the garbage versus beauty, beauty um, discussion. And there are two points of view. I think certainly many of us here are, are by training particle physicists. And then you would say, well, in particle physics, you explain the garbage of everyday life, uh, you know, even you know, collisions in a detector in terms of uh, the reduction to elementary particles. And the true beauty you find in the standard model, this very simple Lagrangian, these very simple rules that then explain very complicated phenomena at larger scales. Um, that's, I would say, what one half of physics uh, looks at when they discuss the beauty in nature. Uh, the other half of physics has just the opposite point of view. Now, if you're a statistical uh, physicist or condensed matter physicist, you would say, well, no, you look at the individual molecules, uh, they're extremely complicated. Um, no, you can look at the individual molecules in a glass of water. Nobody would like to describe this interacting system of 10 to the 24 um, degrees of freedom. The beauty is actually is in a collective behavior, in the hydrodynamics, in thermodynamics. At large scale, you find beautiful laws that actually are very precise. Uh, this is basically John Wheeler's point of view. Uh, the true beauty of the laws of thermodynamics is that they are statistical. Uh, therefore, they are universal. Therefore, they are applied in such wide context. And that's why we all believe that the second law of thermodynamics holds well, for any possible system. But it only holds in a strict limit where the number of components becomes infinitely large. Now, uh, I would say the laws of physics, fundamental physics, have the same dichotomy. No, we have uh, two languages. We have a language of uh, general relativity describing gravity. It's a language of geometry, of curvature, of space and time. And we have a completely separate language to describe the very small, quantum mechanics, with, I'll come back to this, uh, you know, probability, superposition, all these all these uh, crazy, crazy things. And I would say it somehow reflects uh, another dichotomy in mathematics, which uh, is the one between geometry and algebra. You know, even if, if students study mathematics, they, I noticed that, you know, some of them love to think in terms of geometrical figures, uh, in visuals, in terms of right brain activities, and others like very much the algorithmic uh, element in mathematics, the step by step. The, the language way to look at math as a language is basically the left brain approach. And you know, both of them are actually present in, in physics. And one of the points I'm going to make is that you know, often modern string theory, quantum field theory is relating these two halves of our brain. So as we see in much more detail, quantization is actually taking geometrical objects and assigning to them algebraic quantities. Whereas, you know, a lot of uh, modern, um, say, quantum gravity approaches are in the opposite way. They start with an algebraic system, a quantum mechanical system with some number of degrees of freedom, and then show that in the limit where these degrees become very large, effective geometries appear. So geometry is an outcome. It's not a starting point. And so, in some sense, the, the true approach that we are aiming for is a natural synthesis, which I think we call quantum geometry or quantum gravity, that has both the algebra and the geometrical point of view unified. And I think this is certainly something from a mathematical point of view, what string theory aims for and uh, partly succeeds in doing, which is, I think, extremely exciting. Now, if you go back to quantum mechanics, you know, it's good to realize that progress in physics comes with losses and gains. You know, if you, uh, there, are, there are certain elements that uh, you know, if, you, if you learn quantum theory, you have to be accustomed that there are certain things no longer true, like determinism. 
or a visualization of what actually is happening in the world. Well, classical mechanics has a, a setup that is very clear and crisp from a mathematical point of view. You have some phase space, some set of variables, momenta and coordinates. You have a dynamical system that evolves through a Hamiltonian. And basically, you know, that was Newton's big discovery that basically all of science is a dynamical system. Uh, every branch of science is basically science defined as the answer to the question, what happens next? If you go to quantum mechanics, now we have to deal with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You know, P and Q become operators do not commute. So you either think of it in terms of momenta of in positions. I personally very much like this uh, famous uh, quote by Wolfgang Pauli. Uh, when Heisenberg discovered his relation, he wrote to Pauli, and Pauli wrote back, this is two weeks after the discovery, and Pauli writes, well, I think I understand what you are doing. If you, you can see the world with a PI, and one can see the world with a QI, but if one opens both eyes, then one becomes crazy. It's impossible to think of the world both from a momentum and a position point of view. And this duality that in some sense you have to pick a set of variables, but uh, both of them are appropriate, is a, is a wonderful theme, I would say, that is part and parcel of quantum theory and that we're still struggling with. So the wave function and particle in quantum mechanics can be either a function of Q or a function of P. Fourier transform will bring you to one to the other. And I would say it's the earliest uh, occurrence of what we now call a duality. So what quantum mechanic does, of course, it's, it, it does something quite spectacular. It takes this phase space, this very complicated geometry, to be extremely complicated, and quantization replaces it by a state space, a Hilbert space, that typically is infinite dimensional, and becomes linear, uh, of course. And so the gain in quantum mechanics is that we can now take two states and consider their linear superposition. And this, again, from a, from a classical mathematical point of view, something quite bizarre, that you can add the different states of the world in a linear fashion, and that you know, has a probability interpretation. The, the coefficients, absolute value squared, are the probabilities of either event one or event two occurring. Um, so that's a, a major step. And of course, there's this beautiful reformulation in terms of the path integral. So in classical mechanics, I would say, uh, a lot of uh, classical mathematics is answering the question, should it be generalized, how do I get from A to B? And usually there is an action principle there. There's a function that you minimize. And so in plane geometry, obviously it's the straight line. In a curved geometry, it would be a geodesic. And in a more abstract sense, it would be the absolute, or it would be one of the minima of the action. So there's a variational problem that actually uh, gives this specific solution. In quantum mechanics, we have a very different point of view. We have this view of a sum over histories. In quantum mechanics, you explore all possible paths, and each path comes with a probability amplitude. That's e to the i s over h bar. So it's and basically if the action is uh, close to the critical point, it will be a very probable path. And the ones that are far away are much more unlikely. But mathematics, uh, the mathematics of quantum theory forces you to consider all of the different possibilities at the same time, which I would say is a radical different point of view. In fact, it rhymes very well. It resonates with modern mathematics. Because modern mathematics doesn't consider a single object. It always sees it as part of a whole set, I would say, a category of these objects. You never look at a symmetry group, one group, one space, you know, one Lie algebra. You consider the, the set of all these polyhedra. And then you build up layers. So you start with the objects, then you look at the relations among these objects. And then you look at the relations among the relations, and then you build up an infinite tower of more and more complex and more subtle um, information built in of these objects. 
So one of the tremendous insight was that you know this 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 abstract point of view of considering all objects at the same time perfectly fits in the quantum approach where the path integral actually in a natural way adds all these things together. In fact, it adds them together with uh, in one function, a path integral with certain phases. And that's a great thing that this, in some sense, produces formulas. Now, an, another open question is, you know, what is exactly a quantum field theory, which is the bread and butter of uh, modern theoretical physics? So typical, you know, we think of quantum field theory as, as kind of a local quantum system. So I think of this often as a, a bucket of paint. So you have the local rules, uh, mathematically the gauge group, the representation, so the matter and the forces. Then you have a, a space or space-time manifold, and you can basically paint that space-time manifold by covering it with the quantum field theory. And then the formulas of quantum field theory will produce for you numbers like the partition function, scattering functions, etc. So this, I would say, is a very elegant and, and just the way you learn quantum field theory in textbooks. But I think we have come to understand that the situation is much more complex. Because, you know, one of the most amazing thing is that even in that space of field theories, there are dualities. So what typically can happen, and we have, we have billions of, uh, of examples of this, that you can take two different classical field theories, so two buckets of paint, red paint and blue paint, and that these theories, these classical theories, uh, actually are connected because there is a moduli space. There is, if you look at the space of all possible quantum field theories, they both are somehow living at the edge. You know, if you get close to the edge of the space of quantum field theories, you discover uh, the classical limit, essentially. You, you can connect them. So there's a path connecting one system to another system. So the paint is red at one end when we have the one classical limit and the paint is blue in another limit. Um, so what happens in between? What is the color? And so this is, I would say, you know, a vast generalization of uh, the uh, Fourier transform or the wave particle duality of quantum mechanics. And I would say we modern quantum field theories are the same situation. What do we see if we open both eyes, if we see both red and blue? So the remarkable thing in, in, in studying quantum field theory is that though the quantum field theory themselves are quite mysterious objects, uh, we have a much better understanding of uh, the moduli space of it. And uh, by the way, you know, we find both uh, objects of generic beauty and objects of exceptional beauty there. Now, there are other ways to study quantum field theory. You know, you can do it in terms of local algebras. You can do it by trying to cut the space in different ways. And I, say, I think the honest uh, point of view is here that we're still struggling with, I would say, Hilbert six problem. What is the axiomatics, the right axiomatics of quantum field theory? Now, let me now give two examples of the power of these ideas from physics in mathematics. And these are well-known examples. And I won't spend too much time of it. And the first is from particle physics. And you know, it's the application to knot theory. So mathematicians be studying knots, topological knots. They, they want to classify them. And they basically have this set of all possible knots. And they want to, to basically distinguish them. And quantum field theory is perfectly set up to do so. So this goes back to one of my all-time favorite anecdotes. It's uh, here is a little quote from. Uh, Feynman's noble lecture, and he explains the anecdote. He says he's being called in the middle of the night uh, when he was a graduate student by his thesis advisor, John Wheeler, and John Wheeler asked him, why do all electrons have the same charge and the same mass? And he answers, because there is only one electron. They're all the same electron. And this was Wheeler's point of view. Here's space and time. Here's the electron. And in, uh, under Wheeler's law, it's, it's, it's not only to go up in time, but also go back in time and up and back and it can weave a big knot. So he thinks of the trajectory of a particle through space and time as making a knot. And clearly, if you look at this as a series of events, you, know, you have here, you have one particle, but if you cut it in the middle, you see many particles and, and antiparticles, particles going down in time. And clearly, they 
they have the same properties because it's just the same particle that you know has made a few loops through space and time. So it's a beautiful point of view. Um, Feynman describes that immediately remarks, you know, why aren't there equal number of particles and and antiparticles, electrons and positrons, and Wheeler says, well, perhaps they are hidden inside the proton or inside the nucleus. Um, but of course, this was the birth of Feynman diagrams. And one of the simplest possible Feynman diagram is this one. It's the one where a particle and antiparticle are created out of nothing and disappear again. Or if you wish, just a particle going up and down in time through a closed loop. Now, if you think of knots as moving through three-dimensional space-time, so two space and one time direction, you can actually think of a knot as a one of these virtual particles, uh, a vacuum diagram, in particular in this uh, Chern-Simons gate theory. And uh, the rules of physics allow you to calculate the probability amplitudes for such a process. In fact, you can do it even perturbatively. You can look at a quark going around and looking at you know, exchange of a single gluon or two or three or more. So the rules of quantum field theory will assign complex numbers to each of these knots uh, that actually will, uh, um, when the rules are cleverly chosen, will produce a topological invariant. So this is a wonderful example where you take a geometrical object and quantum field theory actually assigns a probability amplitude to it. So these quantum knot invariants have been extremely successful. Um, it led to a blossoming of a field of, of basically this kind of low dimensional topology. And um, I would say this you know, happened in the 1980s and the rest of it is a quite a successful story. Uh, my second example is also quite famous. It's come from string theory. It's uh, the example of mirror symmetry. Now, that's something that evolves uh, a mathematical field called enumerative geometry. It's the calculating the solutions to polynomial equation. Uh, it starts with a space, uh, in fact, a complex three-dimensional space called the quintic in this example. It's the solution to this, uh, this particular equation you see here on the screen. Um, since you can scale the variables, actually there are only a three complex dimension to this. So it's a six dimensional real manifold. It's a solution to Einstein's equation. And mathematicians study um, the curves on such a manifold and you can, a curve is just means that each of these five variables, x1 to f5, are themselves polynomial equations of a certain degree, say degree d. And you can study the number of curves of degree d for d equals one, two, three, et cetera. Well, in a suitable way formulated, uh, you get integers, which are the gromov written invariants. We don't need to go into details. But for instance, you know, if you take d equals one, you count the number of lines on the quintic. There are 2,875 of them. If you take d equals two, you have conics. There's something that was calculated in the, the first was a, a number from the 19th century. This is a number calculated in the 1980s. And then for d equals three, you count the number of cubic, becomes a very large number. These, these calculations were exponentially more difficult. And there's a beautiful story of this particular number because uh, you know, a physicist asked the mathematicians to calculate this number. And when the mathematicians came back with a number, uh, the physicist said, are you sure it's the right number? Are you sure there's not a mistake in your algorithm? And they checked the algorithm and it turns out indeed there was a mistake. And so it took a second iteration to come to this number, 370 million, 206, 375. And of course, the, there was something going on. And the thing that was going on that the physicists had all the numbers. And it's hard to imagine the shock to uh, enumerative geometers, algebraic geometers, when they first saw this list because it's like, it's something that's exponentially more difficult. So how could you do all of these numbers at the same time? And again, it's a beautiful illustration of the power of quantum theory, because actually what was behind this was a string theory calculation, where in string theory, the shape of the string, uh, basically using Feynman's path integral, has to be summed over all possible paths, and so had to be summed over all possible degrees. So one part of this, uh, the solution to this very difficult math problem is to realize that adding all these numbers, these degrees, these gromov witten invariants, n of d, in a single function made sense. And this function actually is the quantum amplitude for a string to be in this particular background. 
Well, the second element was something very deep that you know, if you do this calculation, uh, clearly there's a nice physical interpretation, but it doesn't lead to the solution, that there was a duality that linked the original manifold to a so-called mirror manifold, a manifold with a very different topology that actually was equivalent in the quantum sense. And that it turned out that in the mirror manifold, this very difficult uh, calculation on the left-hand side was essentially very easy. It was a classical object, a classical period, uh, calculated on the right-hand side. So in some sense, by this very fancy form of a Fourier transform, you were able to solve the, uh, this you know, exponentially hard problem on the left in terms of a very elegant formula on the right. Now, in the last you know, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let me say a few words about where, where we are currently. And I would say currently we are at the difficult part. We are now trying to embrace not quantum field theory, but quantum gravity. And quantum gravity is a difficult subject because you know, from an intuitive way, it's the space time itself because becomes a quantum object. So the notions of coordinates, the notions of geometry itself disappear. So how can we do geometry without geometry? And I think this is an outstanding problem. And the, the, the suggestions out of physics, how to deal with that are very deep. And I think you know, will have a tremendous impact in mathematics. So the way I see this is like a three-step process. You know, we start with classical geometry, as uh, goes back to the Babylonians. Then you know, string theory, uh, got us to this level of stringy geometry. Instead of looking at geometry through the eyes of a point, we look at it, the loop space, at string, as how a string is propagating through it. And we already get some magical effects. We get like uh, mirror symmetry, uh, for instance. So two different classical geometries can be connected uh, through one quantum object. But the next phase is where geometry itself starts to disappear. Okay. Quantum, true quantum geometry, I think we are learning, is an emergent phenomena, and it's much better studied dual to quantum systems that have no intrinsic notion of geometry at all. And I would say the break, breakthrough came in the 1990s, in the what's usually called the second uh, superstring revolution, when we realized that string theory not only contains these closed strings, these loops, but contains open strings and contains brains. Brains are subspaces. Um, they could be sheaves, they could be vector bundles um, in a space-time manifold. And a open string is uh, little, literally a, a segment that can begin and end on these brains. Just as closed strings produce gravity, open strings produce gauge fields. And the important conclusion was that if you have multiple of these brains, uh, so instead of you have one, you have n, you're very naturally led to consider uh, non-abelian gauge fields. Uh, in fact, the rank of the gauge field is given by the multiplicity of the brain. And the surprising thing is you can now take a limit where the number of these brains becomes very large and something quite magically happens. Uh, a new form of duality was discovered, which we now call the gauge the gravity duality. Essentially, the statement is a system of large number of brains. So a system of a gauge field of a large rank is dual to a effective curved space-time geometry. So the closed strings on the right-hand side are in some sense you know, equivalent to the open strings on the left-hand side. So in some sense, you can produce curvature, you can produce emergent curved space-time geometry out of a strongly interacting non-abelian gauge field. Now, the intuition behind this is a little bit the following. So uh, if you think of the Feynman diagrams describing open strings, they have a very beautiful interpretation. They're not little cylinders, they're little strips. The interactions of open strings, uh, you can think of as a very natural thing. It's essentially matrix multiplication. So the, you, you glue the strips together. And so if you consider open string diagrams, as you see in the animation on the left, and you consider a, a, a large, quant strongly interacting quantum effect. So when there are basically uh, many, many loops in these open string diagrams, then like, 
uh, this is, was the original intuition of Gerard het Hoofd, that in some sense the, the surface start to be filled in. These are kind of fishnet diagrams. You know, in some sense you start to fill in the middle. And so if there are strong quantum effects, the open string diagrams essentially become an effective closed string on the right hand side. So this is, this is a very physical intuition. It's very difficult to make this you know, rigorous in a mathematical sense but it has been extremely productive. Of course, the most, you know, most uh, productive uh, application in physics has been the ADS CFT correspondence by formulae by Juan Maldacena, but basically tells us that the gate theory on a, uh, the boundary of an anti de Sitter space, so that's a negatively curved um, space-time geometry, that a an, an, an gate theory on the boundary of that space is equivalent to a bulk theory on the interior. Now, whenever these very fuzzy physical concepts emerge, of course, mathematicians ask, you know, how do you make this precise? How have you seen this before? And I would say, well, there's at least one place where I've seen this before. And that's my, my, one of my favorite examples and goes back to uh, Eugene Wigner again. Now, Wigner introduced uh, in the 1950s, famously, matrix models. He was studying uh, the Hamiltonian of uh, very complicated nuclear systems. And he found it very difficult to write down the Hamiltonian. And then he, he uh, pioneered a statistical approach and said, well, instead of taking a specific matrix, let's, uh, Hermitian matrix, let's look at a statistical ensemble of matrices. And he actually started uh, studying these Gaussian ensembles, but you can study much more complicated uh, statistical ensembles. So, this is actually very much like the opening paragraph of his essay about the unreasonable effectiveness. It's, uh, there, there are lots of factors of pi here. And, and what he discovered is that if you take the limit where um, you, know, you look at the distribution of the eigenvalues um, in, uh, as, a, as a statistical distribution for a matrix of large rank, that actually quite surprisingly, if you scale the eigenvalues, um, the eigenvalues lie in a finite band. Uh, there are no eigenvalues that are larger than square root of n. And so if you scale them and take n to infinity, you get a continuum distribution. And this continuous distribution actually uh, turned out to have the shape of a circle, a semicircle. So it's a very sharp edge. And I would say this is the Ur example of an effective geometry. It's a statistical mechanical model by cranking up the degrees of freedom, the rank of the matrix, certainly in the statistical limit, in the thermodynamical limit, a geometry appears. And so uh, this is just a simple example, I think of a generic phenomena that we have to understand mathematically. How can we have effective geometries coming out of systems of large complexity? So basically the physicist says, if you take these non-abelian, um, algebraic systems of a certain kind, they have a dial, which is the number of degrees of freedom. If you turn the dial to infinity, you will see smooth geometry appearing. Now, I think these two operations, emergence and quantization, are both pretty uh, problematic from a mathematical point of view. But I think they are the two tools that uh, theoretical physicists have. They can either reduce to elementary building blocks or elementary laws can emerge out of systems with great complexity. So essentially also what modern string theory is telling mathematics is that the two sides of the mathematical brain, the geometrical and the algebraic point of view, in some deep sense are equivalent. There is a duality relating the two. That is to say that the concepts on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Oh, minimal surfaces, Riemannian geometries, uh, loop spaces, the closed strings, all of that is in a deep sense equivalent to studying the, the bread and butter of algebra, modern algebra, such as vector bundles, gate theories, K theory, matrix models, etc. Now, all of this goes, I think, even deeper. This is the famous uh, line by John Wheeler um, that he formulated in the 1960s and 70s that he called it from bit. This is actually a famous diagram 
that uh, appears in the book Gravitation. I remember reading this, uh, you know, as a, a, a high school senior, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And I think we still haven't idea. But he had this idea that there's a big knitting machine that, uh, you know, feeds information and then creates space time uh, by how the little bits are connected to each other. Uh, I think this is an extremely fruitful idea, and I would say this is the most exciting thing that's happening currently in theoretical physics. Uh, you no know, black holes are the place where the action happens. Uh, notice uh, black holes are the perfect example of this kind of it from bit or the modern version it from qubit because it's quantum information. As you know, black holes from a gravity point of view, from a geometrical point of view, are the most simple possible objects nothing more than literally a hole in space and time. But from a quantum perspective, they're the most complex object because they're the densest, densest way to store information, uh, roughly one qubit per Planckian surface unit of the horizon. And you know, there are, uh, the concept of the bekenstein hawking geometric entropy allows you to calculate the amount of information inside a quantum black hole. So I think this is extremely exciting, and there are some reflections of this in modern mathematics. Another thing I think that we still are struggling to interpret in a nice mathematical way is that you know, gravity, geometry, is built upon locality. So what does it mean to, for two points to be close together? And I have no time to go into it, but another exciting development is that the way lo locality can be created uh, which is uh, the concept of a wormhole or an Einstein-Rosen bridge in classical relativity, seem to be very closely connected to the way in which quantum information can be entangled. So superposition of uh, quantum states that are not direct products, the, uh, the things that are famous in the uh, EPR paradox. So what we are seeing is in some sense, you know, uh, a beautiful dictionary uh, appearing between the, the, the geometrical language and the algebraic language of physics, and I would say also mathematics. So where are we now? So I would still say that, you know, we started with Galileo with this kind of uh, nature, the book of nature that we want to read that's written in the language of mathematics. I think, I, I wish that would be true, but I think we are uh, in a little bit of mixed state. You know, I think we have the language of physics and we have the language of mathematics, and they're not one and the same. Um, I think what we are building are dictionaries, uh, bringing one to the other. And although there have been astonishing applications of these deep physical ideas being brought into mathematics, uh, uh, I think, you know, in some ways, I like to say that math and physics seem to be non-commuting objects. That you know, one thing I've noticed that it's extremely difficult to make the physical intuition behind many of these ideas mathematical precise. And often what happens is that, you know, the physical intuition gets translated into a conjecture, and then that conjecture is proven using rigorous mathematics. So that's beautiful, it's striking, it's very productive, but it's, an, it's a bit disappointing, I think, that we haven't yet found uh, the precise language of both fields. So they're more like metaphors, perhaps, or analogies. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, this is a famous quote by André Wey. André Wey, basically famous IS mathematician, he discovered uh, you know, what we now call arithmetic geometry, how number theory and geometry can be connected. And often he used himself the image of a Rosetta stone. And he says, you know, nothing is more fucking nor we know then the obscure analogies, the blurred reflection from one theory to nothing. Nothing gives more pleasure to the researcher. One day the illusion drifts away, the premonition changes to a certitude. The twin theories reveal their common source before disappearing. And I think we are very much in that spirit. You know, we see these uh, we see these illusions of understanding, but sometimes they drift away. And also, I think there's a question of what is the final outcome. What is the knowledge that we try to achieve? And I have kind of two images, you know, uh, is it, uh, will our knowledge be like a globe that we have, you know, a perfect understanding from all possible perspectives? 
or will our knowledge me be more like an atlas where you have like separate maps and then you have um, you know, basically dictionaries, uh, ways to tell you how you go from one map to another. I think if we're honest and we look both in terms of the state of theoretical physics, uh, fundamental theoretical physics, but also I think about the state of math and physics, we're very much on the first. You know, we, we have all these overlapping domains um, that you know, each of them have their own language, their own concepts. There are dictionaries bringing us from one domain to another. But I think the, the thing that is really missing, and perhaps it will never come, is this kind of universal language that covers everything. So I think for me, the big open question is, is there something like quantum mathematics? Now we know the classical world has perhaps been most, the most productive inspiration of math. Everyday experience has given us numbers, has given us geometry, has given us calculus, symmetry. It's, we see it all around us. And we know that quantum theory, and particularly you now the deepest understanding of space and time and gravity and particles and fields must be an even more fruitful source of, uh, of mathematical inspiration. So to end, uh, Jeff, you asked me, you know, what, is the, what, what would I put uh, as a, a sign here for the situation of string math in 2020? So I think the great thing is that, you know, compared to the 1960s and 1990s, it's not that mathematicians and physicists are you know, in their own world or in each other's world, but I think we now have a, a much more, um, you know, uh, we have, we, I think we have a breakthrough. I think the two, uh, the two rooms are being reconstructed. I think we'll, we are, we're building a single, a single space, but uh, I feel it's still very much uh, under construction. So with that, I want to end. Thank you very much. I'm going to unmute everybody so that we could ap applaud um, Robert Dekov's beautiful and inspirational lecture. Oh, so obviously we missed it. Cool thing. Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody now um, and invite questions. Um, to ask a question, you can raise your hand and I will call on you. If you look at the participant button, you can press that. And at the bottom of the participant button, there's a raise hand feature. So um, I, I, I open the floor to, to questions. Okay, if in the absence of a question, I'll start. Um, oh, I see. Um, Akadi Weinstein has a question. You can unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, okay, Robert, uh, I am trying to uh, ask you a uh, comment on the following. To me, uh, you know, the most impressive, um, you know, development uh, recently was that uh, that in some way, kind of, um, kind of, uh, that the notion of local field theory. Uh, going go, goes to some sense in the at the end um, because normally in local field theory we believe we start from short distances and we can explain whatever is going on in the theory at the, at the, at large distance in particular. But when the gravity becomes uh, uh, in the play, you know, uh, it looks like this notion is is ended. So the theory, you know, this kind of idea of construction that you can do everything starting from a uh, lo local version does not work. Okay, I don't know. I just wonder in, uh, of your opinion on this. Well, I think that's a very good point. So, uh, as we say, if if uh, if gravity tells us that space time emerge, then one question, of course, also is, uh, you know, do you first have an emergent space time, and then you get a quantum field theory built upon that, or do both of them emerge at the same time? And you no, know, this is. You, know, you you can say that we still have a little bit of an asymmetric situation. I think you know, it, from that point of view, the language of geometry, the language of general relativity, is emergent, and we make quantum theory more fundamental. Uh, but it could be that you know, in some sense, quantum itself has uh, a certain emergent quantity to it, right? And uh, so perhaps it's a better way to say is that if whatever the underlying structure is. 
out of it should come space-time and the local rules on the space-time itself. So I think it's that's you know that's the only way in which it can appear. And of course, we see examples of that. You know, where you know, in, in in many of these kind of holographic models, you not only get an effective theory of gravity, but you get an theory of gravity with, with a bunch of gauge fields or matter fields on top of it. So you're quite right. So in some sense, uh, and I think this might point out to uh, some fundamental, perhaps misunderstanding we have about quantum field theories. I think, you know, we, we thought we understand them because it's a local set of rules. We know already that you know, that's very different difficult to explain dualities in terms of that because what's your favorite set of local ingredients but perhaps we should uh, think about the emergent uh, quantum field theories too i think i'm you, you're quite right okay thank you okay um madav tiwari Hi, I'm Michael. Yeah, yeah. So the, my my question is: uh, Do we have any relations uh, with uh, proper mathematical formula for entropy and time? Do you have a proper mathematical formula relating to proper time and with entropy? Well, you know, I think you as as I think that the right mathematical formalism is present to understand classical entropy and classical information. You know, um, I would say that you know what we are, are probably is you know, something that really has to develop. You know, what is the appropriate sense to think about quantum entropies in this context? And I think that would be an extremely fruitful area to explore. Um, you know, we have some bits of information there, but I think we, we don't have an all-encompassing theory of. Yeah, I, I, I have been reading this space is from bit. So I, I thought that time can also from bit, you know. Well, that's also a good question. And it's a little bit related to previous discussion that, uh, you know, we, I think, you know, in, in our current models, we have uh, some very crisp examples where we see an emergent space direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if you almost use elementary logic, so we know that space can emerge, we know that relativity theory will connect space and time. So the question is, how can time emerge? And you know, there are many deep ideas about this, but I would say we are mostly confused about this. As you know, in quantum mechanics, time is treated in a very different way than space. And um, what I've learned, at least from people have thought more about this, like Nimar Khani and Metz, you know, he, I think his, his point of view is that, you know, probably, you know, if time, if there's a model where time emerged, then time will emerge together with quantum theory. So, so probably you, you shouldn't have, a, it's very difficult to have an emergent time within quantum theory because our formal, usual formulations of quantum theory involve a choice of Hamiltonian. So probably we're looking at systems where, uh, so, so to say, the full Schroeder equation emerges mm. uh, at once. Um, that seemed a good intuition, but I don't think we have any any concrete example at this moment. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, maybe I can take the opportunity to ask a more philosophical question then. Um, so you know, last year I, I, I taught a course in mathematical physics and, and one of the things that I used to do to get my students engaged was give them an, uh, an, an integral of the week that they had to solve. And the rule was you couldn't use complex analysis. Mm. You had to solve it in, in as tricky a way as you could find. And usually these things had, you know, one or two line answers or maybe half a page answer. And it usually was some, some, some clever trick or the other. And the student who actually won the whole competition that I ran over the whole semester would, would, um, would give these many page answers and he'd refine his answers and give them back again. And as a physicist, I, you know, I, I found this initially quite frustrating because there was always a, a, a trick that I wanted to see, and that was what I was gonna count as correct. Until I realized that actually the reason he was doing this was because he was savoring the problem. Mm. In, every, in every solution he was, he was producing, you know, he would, he would give this answer that was inspired. Um, and it wasn't the quick answer, and it wasn't the, you know, the clever answer, but it was a beautiful inspired answer. So my question is, you know, 
today we're, we're seeing these massive developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning to the point where it kind of doesn't make any sense to have my kids learn chess because they're never ever going to be the best chess player in the world. No. Um, you know, the best chess player in the world is, is, hasn't been a human being in 20 years. Um, do you think, do you think that AI will ever get to the point where it can savor a proof? Well, let me just share one thing. So as you know, uh, at the Institute for a long time, we had Vladimir Wojvodsky, a famous mathematician and uh, who, whose goal in life was to teach computers abstract mathematics. So in his field was category theory, abstract algebraic topology. So it was very, very difficult. And you know, he, he, he started that prog program and he wrote a very long paper, I think a 700 page paper and found a mistake in it. And then he was surprised that he made a mistake, but he was even more surprised that nobody cared about it. <laughs> and then he felt, I, I have to have a very smart assistant. And so you could ask, why, why would you need that? Because you know, why do we need 700 page proofs? But I guess you know, a good question is, you know, uh, if we want to find a certain mathematical truth, Think of this, you know, as you're standing on the shore and how deep have you swim in, swim in the ocean to find it? What is the natural, are, are all the great ideas in mathematics, you know, drifting close to the, to the beach? Or do you have to venture deep inside it? And often I think what we have done in, 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 in history is build little islands, you know, step by step. Uh, and so at some point there was a discussion, one of his colleagues asked, uh, asked uh, Vologia, you know, why are you so interested in these very long proofs? You know, isn't it much nicer to have a short proof? And his answer was, well, what do you like better, a long walk in the woods or a short walk in the woods? So that, there might be something in what we're trying to find out that we need to take a very long walk uh, with many, many steps and great complexity. And then I think we can truly ask, you know, are, is our human mind and it, collectively in, in our society, are we able to you know, climb that high mountain, so to say, uh, without using any artificial means? So I could imagine that you know, um, there's no guarantee that, and we have seen this in the past, you know, there are uh, simple, relatively simple stated mathematical problems that uh, like the Kepler conjecture on fitting, you know, spheres, the close packing of spheres in three dimension that basically needed thousands of 10,000 of pages of proofs. So uh, I think the physicists feel that whatever it's a good idea, it should be brief and, and, and easily to understand and, and intuitively simple. Um, but I think we, we might be mistaken and also we, don't realize that we had many centuries to work our way towards that point where we finally say, oh, it's, a, it's an intuitive thing. So I could imagine that AI or, you know, it's, it's, it's scientists working together with these, these, these machines could be useful. And I noticed that uh, Wojvodsky would like to show this. So he had this program and the program is trying to make a certain proof and you could suggest something to uh to the to the computer and so you suggested well think about general induction and then it would spit out pages and pages and pages but then it would stop again because then it needed another suggestion so that might be a way in which we work in the future you're muted yeah there are some questions in the chat um, let me see. How does Hawking radiation affect black holes? I don't know if you want to take that. Uh, oh, let's see. I don't see it here. Okay. At the bottom of the chat page. Well, that's a kind of a long story, but you know, I think uh, the wonderful thing is some of these mathematical models of quantum black holes that came out of string theory. Uh, give a pre very precise way to calculate the Hawking radiation beyond the statistical uh, approach. So 
I think you know what was very impressive and what made many of us in the field uh, you know, really excited is that this idea that there is a precise quantum mechanical model underlying Hawking's calculation, which you know remind you was a statistical calculation, um, you know, somehow made everybody you know, realize that um, we might be very close to un understanding at least for some specific. I would say very mathematical, conveniently chosen models of black holes, we have a full quantum mechanical understanding. So um, again, in this kind of battle between geometry and quantum, where geometry is predicting a more, you know, uh, the loss of information and this you know, thermal radiation, I would say in these models, quantum comes out as um, a more precise answer that actually gives a, um, you know, microscopic way to deal with with um, Hawking radiation and quantum information. There's much more to be said about it and but I think you know that that was an important element in this in this um, development. Thank you. I think the same speaker has a, a questioner has a follow-up question. Do you consider black holes to be a reality or a mathematical fantasy? <laughs> Well, uh, it, it's it's one of these wonderful examples where a mathematical fa uh, fantasy became a reality. I would say, uh, you know, we have seen Im images of them. Uh, you know, it's it's not yet mathematical proof, but it's uh, uh, we are seeing uh, we're getting closer closer to to the horizon, and um, you know, it's one of the most spectacular predictions of of Einstein's theory, uh, so spectacular that he himself had serious doubts. Uh, of, of the nature of it. And, and I would say, you know, uh, black hole is perhaps you know, one of the great gifts to, uh, to us, to the scientific community, because it's, um, you know, it's been said it's the equivalent of the atom 100 years ago, in the sense that you know, we know it exists on paper. Um, we know it exists in nature. On paper, there are lots of paradoxes. There's a lot of confusion. But somehow nature seemed to have found a way to solve it, and I think this is the great advantage. If you're in physics instead of mathematics, that you know in physics you can sometimes argue that at least nature has already solved the homework. So now it's up to us to find this, the solution that nature has picked. Thank you, KJ Runia. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Um... First of all, thank you very much, Professor Dijk, uh, for uh, your wonderful lecture. Very much enjoyed it. I'm terribly sorry for not having any webcam uh, installed on my primitive Linux computer. Um, I would like, I've, I have no knowledge about string theory, um, but uh, about your measurement problem, um, we've um, probably become familiar with the, your standard textbook interpretation, like the Copenhagen's interpretation, the collapses of wave functions, and all that. Um, is, there, uh, is there any perspective that string theory might give on the measurement problem? So it was kind of weak, but the question was whether there is any perspective coming from string theory on the measurement problem. You know, there are, of course, there are many intrinsic problems in quantum theory themselves. So one of the things is the interpretation of quantum theory, where you know, in some sense we uh, are in the, as I would say, in, in, in the I think typical polls show that there's not even a, a, like uh, there's no majority uh, interpretation or various ways to uh, interpret quantum theory. I would say up to now, string theory is working in a very traditional way in within quantum mechanics, and so uh, it comes with all the benefits of quantum theory, but it also comes with all the problems. Um, no. The great thing, of course, is that also allows us to address cosmological issues. So I would say there could be a promise. There could be a promise that some of the interpretations in quantum theory um, you know, get a res resolution or a, a different interpretation by understanding its link to space and time and geometry. But I think it's fair to say that at this point, there, um, it's, there hasn't been a a, a kind of new perspective on the measurement problem that actually um, 
is coming from this kind of gravitational point of view. But perhaps some of the other speakers of this conference have, have a different point of view. But I think actually there's no no insight that I know of. So I think these are still uh, outstanding issues. OK, thank you very much. Um, Sam Waldring. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you for the talk. It was very nice and entertaining to listen to. Um, I have a question as regards to your personal views on the future of uh, education at universities with mm. respect to the fusion of this uh, or the emergence of this mathematical physics and physical mathematics that you, uh, yeah, the new era that's uh, come into fruition. Well, I think in some sense that uh, my experience is that though um, uh, students always have been extremely creative and flexible and, you know, are uh, able to get info information on both sides. But I think one thing that we have seen, and I think there's ver very much a trend, is that uh, clearly the level of mathematical sophistication in various branches of physics has been increased. Um, so, where in the early 70s, you know, people had no idea that what they were doing in, in physics actually had a counterpart in mathematics. I think these days there's much more refined mathematics that you have to know. And, you know, I think actually personally I feel that, you know, I'm not sure there's an upper bound in the kind of math that you need to know. I think people joke if you have common sense, everybody feels that they have exactly the right amount of common sense, not too much and too less. Now, there, there might be a certain understanding uh, among uh, physicists that they know just the right amount of mathematics. Um, but you know, I think we have learned over, um, you know, through history that um, it, it's very difficult, you know, going back to Wigner, to de declare that a certain piece of math is not effective. Uh, I think there's even a folk theorem among physicists that if there's one part of mathematics, that you have been consistently not learning, skipping all the lectures that you want to absolutely want refuse to learn, say what a, uh, a sheaf is, that uh, in the end, this will be exactly the thing you need in your physics research. And so uh, this actually literally happened. I remember Joe, Joe Polchinski, the discoverer of brains, walking past the blackboard where we were discussing sheaves and he came and took an eraser and erased the word sheaf. <laughs> didn't want to know about that. I actually said, well, it's the thing you're doing. It's actually, you, you brought it into, uh, into physics. So uh, I think actually it's, you know, my, my advice also to students is, you know, uh, certainly in the, in the beginning phase, read widely in mathematics. And there, there are certain, undoubtedly certain branches of mathematics that we haven't been incorporating in a correct way. You know, uh, one thing that always has been on the horizon, I would say, certainly, uh, over the last decades has, has been number theory. You know, it's clearly one of the most exciting areas of mathematics. I think we are still struggling to find the right application. Um, you know, um, some people doubt that we've, we'll see number theory applied in, in quantum theory in our lifetimes, but I think you know, some of uh, the younger students in this audience might actually do so. So that could be an area that you might invest some time in. Um, there's a question in the chat from Robin Rathen. Oh yeah, although Galilei said the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, I think it gives only the mathematical truth. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I understand the question. Um, I think th th there's a certain, perhaps, you. Perhaps the point is, you know, to what, I mean, if 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 we use mathematics, what part of reality can we capture? And um, I think a typical attitude of a scientist would be everything, but um, if you have the right mathematical language. And so, in that sense, I think Galileo uh, was an interesting statement because he said, you know math is the language to describe nature and he was using euclidean geometry um while actually what we of course 
found out soon after that actually the right mathematical language is the language of calculus, of you know, analysis, etc. that still had to be developed. So I would say there is this, that was my original point of the math being an environmental science. And if you bring math in a new context, you learn new part, new vocabulary, which then uh, is being added to the mathematical part of the dictionary. So in some sense, if there are parts of science that are not being able to capture mathematics, I think, you know, are probably, if you believe that weakness, unreasonable effectiveness continues, I think we hope that we're able to develop new parts of math that are actually able to capture this. And I think that's in some sense, perhaps the, for me, the overarching question that we are right now, you know, there are certain branches of mathematics that we have been using, but perhaps also new branches of mathematics have to be developed. And I think actually physics, quantum physics, can be a great inspiration for finding these, these new parts of the language. Um, Hassan Khan? Hi. So you mentioned at the end of your talk that the most uh, interesting or exciting sort of uh, open problem is the development of this uh, hypothetical quantum mathematics, which will sort of clarify and make manifest the different dualities that we see in physics and math. Uh, do you know, or do you consider some present work that you think is on the right track towards this program? Or what is the most promising thing that is in mm. existence that you think is uh, getting towards this? Um, I, I think, you know, we, um, in some sense, everything and nothing. Uh, in, I think actually the more, um, no, the more, I think one, one thing that's very positive is that we're seeing basically the return of, I would say, something of the more axiomatic uh, approach to, to quantum field theory. Now, whether it's the um, looking at scattering amplitudes, looking at uh, conformal blocks, looking at the the more category category theory approach, um, you know that's something that you you could think that was a little bit approach in perhaps in the 1960s, and it was of course overtaken by the wonderful success of the standard model and the and and quantum gate theories and everything that brought. Back. But um, I think this kind of more axiomatic point of view might be interesting because it's you know it's it's as far removed from Feynman diagrams and Lagrangians as we as we can be, and I think it might you know shed a certain new light on uh, on um, on quantum field. So I find that promising. Um, it, it involves also very. Advanced, uh, advanced mathematics. So I think that actually um, might be a promising event. But I think you know, the good thing is that I would say that in a little bit of meta remark that I think in theoretical physics, we have convergent periods where basically all thinking about the same issue, which is very exciting. And but I, I think we typically call them revolutions. So we essentially all cite the same paper. And then there are periods where we have divergent views, where we are approaching many different directions, um, which often in retrospect are the most fruitful parts of the history of science. So I think the fact that we are exploring many different directions now, I think is a great thing and uh, we should encourage this. Thanks, very interesting, thanks. I think in the light of, of the time, um, I don't want to impose any further on um, Robert. So um, I would like to unmute everybody and we'd like to thank the speaker again.